You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome to a Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel. I serve as the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. This program is brought to you by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee and a number of faithful congregations throughout a four state area. You'll see their names listed at the end of our program today. We also want to extend our thanks to two new congregations. We don't have them on our scroll yet, but they're the New Madrid Church of Christ in New Madrid, Missouri and the Maple Hill Church of Christ in Benton, Kentucky. They're now supporting us and we appreciate their financial support. That brings a Bible answer to you. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them do so, announce uh, themselves to you at this time. Hello, I'm Brent Arnold from the Greenfield Church of Christ in Greenfield, Tennessee. My name is Andy Brewer. I preach for the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee. My name is Mike Peters. I'm the preacher at the Pottsville Church of Christ in Hickory, Kentucky. Great to have them with us. Great to have you watching. Our first question to Brother Andy Brewer. To what does the anointing refer to in 1 John 2, 27? Brother Brewer. I think to really adequately answer this question, you, you've got to go into 1 John 2 and see exactly why it was John was writing to those disciples to begin with. And thankfully, we don't have to go back very far in the chapter from the verse under consideration to figure that out. Because in verse 26 of that same chapter, this is what he said, These things have I written unto you, concerning them that would lead you astray. And so it seems pretty clear from John's statement that, that what John was writing, at least from that point forward over the next several verses, he was writing in order to warn those Christians about what false teachers, what deceivers that were among them that could potentially lead them astray. Now, with that in mind, I want you to take just a minute and, and ask yourself, how is it that a person could be led astray with words? I mean, how is it that someone could deceive you? If someone were to lie to you or tell you something that was just blatantly false, why would you be deceived about that? Well, you would only be deceived about that if you had not previous to that time been otherwise informed with truth. In other words, think, think for an example, if, if one of your children came to you and just outrightly lied to you about either something they had done or somewhere they were going to be, and, and you fell for the trap, you were deceived, uh, you, you believed it and they led you astray, why would, why would you be deceived? Well, you would only be deceived if you previously did not already know either what they had done in the past or where they were going to be in the future, or whatever the, the situation was. Now, take that same thought process and apply it to what John's talking about here. He's talking to a group of Christians about the potential for them being deceived by false teachers. But the only way that they could be deceived and be led into error, doctrinal error, would be if they had previously not already been educated or informed as to what the truth was, if they had not already been adequately been able to defend what they believed with a proper knowledge. Now, it's based on that context that John was wanting to warn his brethren about those people that could deceive them. Uh, and he said in verse 27, which is the verse under consideration, And as for you, the anointing which ye received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that anyone teach you, but as his anointing teacheth you concerning all things, and is true, and is no lie, and even as it is taught you, ye abide in him. Now, the question uh, is, what does that word anointing refer to, or what is that anointing? Uh, the word anointment uh, simply means to be endowed with something or for something to be provided uh, to you or upon you. 
And so a person could be anointed with any number of things. Uh, Jesus, at one point in His life, uh, had His feet anointed with oil. That is, a, a woman actually poured oil upon Him. Um, but it's quite obvious here that John's not talking about some physical property being anointed on them. Uh, in the verse, John refers to, quote-unquote, His anointing. That is, the anointing that is directed upon them from a person or a being. And in this verse, John refers to this anointing as being something that taught them, not something that was physical, something that was poured upon them, or something that was placed upon them, but something that was taught to them, or something that was given to them, so that they would be prepared to defend their faith against those deceivers. Uh, and so contextually it seems that John is referring to a miraculous knowledge uh, that would be provided to them by God, uh, given to them by the Holy Spirit, that empowered them to protect themselves from the doctrinal deception that had begun to take root among them. Now, thankfully though, we don't have to just assume that what we've just taken from this passage is correct because... You can go back to verse 20, uh, and John tells them what this anointing is. Uh, back in verse 20 of 1 John 2, John himself had said, And ye have an anointing from the Holy One, and ye know, that is, as a result of that anointing, ye know all things. Uh, and so there seems to be no doubt that given the context of this passage, John is referring to the fact that those first century Christians to whom the completed revelation of the Bible had not yet been completed, for whom it had not been completed, wouldn't be completed for uh, some years later, that for those first century Christians to whom the completed revelation, such as we have contained in the Bible today, it was not complete, that for those Christians God provided a miraculous knowledge so that they would be prepared to defend themselves and to defend the faith uh, against those deceivers, those false teachers among them. Uh, that was what the anointing was. It was a miraculous power given to them by the Holy Spirit. Uh, thank you for that good question, and I hope that helps in some way. Thank you. To Brother Peters, this question. Are there degrees of sin? Brother Peters. Well, thank you for that question. And before we answer the question uh, in particular, uh, we need to understand what sin is. Sin, the word sin, comes from a word that means literally to miss the mark. Uh, we might think of an archer who takes his arrow and he's aiming for that target. He's aiming for that bullseye, but as he flings his arrow toward it, the arrow goes wild and misses the target completely. Well, that's the idea behind the word sin. I'm aiming to live my life according to God's Word. I'm aiming to live my life according to what He says, and when I fall short of that, my arrow goes wild, I miss the mark, well, that's sin. Now, sin, missing that mark, not living up to God's Word, is what ultimately separates us from God. Isaiah 59 and verse 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you, that He will not hear. So sin separates us from God. When I miss the mark of God's Word, that separates me from Him. Now, mankind tends to look at sins as big sins and small sins. We might say, well, surely telling that little lie isn't the same as going out and committing murder. Well, in God's view, both are sin. Both will separate us from Him. And so from God's view, there really isn't a degree of sin there. That lie separates me from God. Committing murder separates me from God. And so there isn't degrees of sin from God's view. But we look more at the consequences of those sins, and, and some sins have greater consequences than others that we experience in this life, immediate consequences. And so because those consequences are different, we tend to look at sins as big sins and, and little sins. And, you know, we might tell that lie and it might hurt someone's feelings when the truth comes out. It might hurt a relationship. 
Well, that's a smaller consequence when, than when I go out and commit murder and lose all of my freedom and have to go to jail for life. But there's an eternal consequence that we don't readily see right away. And we need to understand the eternal consequence of all sin whether we term it bigger or big sin or small sin, the eternal consequence is that it's going to separate me from God. And so from God's view, there are no degrees of sin. Thank you for that question. We've reached the halfway point of our program today and we want to offer to you a free tract. Our tract today is The Age of Accountability. If you like this tract, or to receive our free eight lesson Bible correspondence course that you may take in the privacy of your home, or to send us your Bible question. Please contact us. You may write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can email us your request at a Bible answer at earthlink.net. You can call our toll free number 1-800-436-0463 in order to leave your request and your full address. You can also go to our website. You're seeing there the address www.abibleanswertv.com. Back to our questions today, our next question for Brother Arnold. Is it okay to engage in hand clapping during the singing of the church? Brother Arnold. Well, I know this is a very popular uh, practice with many uh, religious services today. Uh, there's obviously a, a great deal of excitement associated with it and it stirs an emotional response. But uh, the question that we're asking here uh, is not so much whether or not it's exciting or whether or not it's emotional, but whether or not there is authority in Scripture for it. And that should always be a question that we ask when it comes to uh, doing things that we're doing to the glory of God. In John 4.24, the Bible says, God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Uh, he wants to be, us to worship Him from the heart. It should be an expression of our love, our praise, our thanksgiving. Uh, it's not just a going through the motions. It must come from the heart. But it also must be in truth. And uh, that demands that we go to the Scripture first to uh, discover what it is that, that God... Uh, desires for us to do in worship. Over in Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the Bible says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We'll come back to that phrase in just a moment. But right now I want to focus on this last one, where it says, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. What does it mean to do something in the name of Jesus? If, if you're going to do something in His name, you, you need to be sure that it's something He would approve. And the only way we can really do that is to go to Scripture and use that as our basis of authority. Now how do we determine what is authorized in Scripture? Andy dealt with this earlier and did a magnificent job. Uh, when we go to Scripture for authority, we're looking for a number of things. We're looking for explicit statements and implied statements. We're, we're looking for commands and examples. If God commands us to do it, then we know we have authority. That's simple, isn't it? Or if we can turn to an example, and here, are, here, are, here is an example where other Christians did this, God approved of it then. Well, that's simple. That we would know that God would approve of it today. There's also the uh, issue of expediency. And basically what I mean by that is that when God makes a command, then everything that we need and have to have to carry out that command is authorized by the command itself. I don't know of a specific verse in the New Testament that mentions songbooks, but we, we have to have songs to sing, and that demands that we all be able to sing together. So, so the uh, need for a songbook as an expedient is authorized by the command itself. Now, that being said, I've searched, uh, I've looked, I've tried to find it, but the fact remains, and I, I believe if you'll check me, you'll find that this is true, that there is no command for hand clapping in the worship of the church. There is no example of it. 
There's not a church of the New Testament. There's not a Christian of the New Testament that we can turn to as an example of uh, performing this act in worship to God. There is there's no expedient. There, there is no command that's given in the New Testament whereby hand clapping would be an expedient that it would be necessary to fulfill that command uh, before God. It's, it, it's simply not there. Uh, now, uh, some would object to what I'm saying in, 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 by saying that well, what about passages like Psalm 47.1, where it says, O oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Brent, aren't you forgetting that passage? Does that not authorize the practice of this? Well, what I would say in response to this, and, and why I do not attribute that passage as being authority for us to do that today in the church, is because that passage is from the Old Testament. It's important for us when we study the Bible to see the distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Colossians 2.14, the Bible indicates that God has taken the Old Testament, He nailed it to the cross, and He has implemented a new covenant. Romans 7, 1 through 4 also indicates that. The fact of the matter is, there are a number of practices from, that were authorized under the Old Testament that we do not repeat today. Uh, Sabbath worship was authorized under the Old Testament. We don't do that today. We worship on the Lord's Day on Sunday because that's the day that Jesus was resurrected. Uh, various offerings of animal sacrifices, uh, burning of incense. There, there, there are a number of things that were a part of the Old Testament law that were authorized under that law that are not uh, authorized today. So we go to the New Testament to find our authority. And the fact of the matter is, the passages just aren't there. Every passage from the New Testament that makes reference to music in the church uses the same word. I, I read one of them just a moment ago, Colossians 3.16. It uses the word sing. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, sing is a specific command, isn't it? It's not generic. Uh, if the Lord had said, make music unto me, well, that's generic. That would have authorized just any sort of music that we would seek to offer Him. But He didn't give a generic command. He gave a specific command. He wants us to sing. I think the reason for that, I don't know that it's my place to tell what God's reason is for that, but if I were to guess, my guess would be God wants us to sing because singing is an act that can truly reflect what's in the human heart. Clapping cannot express gratitude. It cannot express praise. It cannot express love. Uh, this is the same reason why we, we, wouldn't, we do not use a piano or organ or, or uh, an instrument of a mechanical nature. A, me a mechanical instrument does not have a heart to express uh, those, uh, those sentiments. God wants us to sing because singing can be a reflection of the sentiment that is in the human heart. And uh, we are to worship God in spirit, of course. That's one of those things that we've mentioned. Same is true in regard to hand clapping. Think about it this way. Uh, God commanded Noah to build an ark to save his family from the flood that was to come. If he had said to Noah, build that ark of wood, that would have authorized Noah to use any wood that he would choose. But uh, God commanded Noah to use gopher wood. Now, evidently that was a tree that we don't have today. I don't know exactly what gopher wood was, but Noah would have known. And Noah understood that God wanted the ark built of that wood and only that wood. See, it was a specific command. Same is true regarding the music of the New Testament church. The specific command that is given is singing. And so without that command or without that example or without that expedient, I would have to say that no, hand clapping is not authorized for use in the worship of the New Testament church. Thank you for this question. Thank you. And now to Brother Brewer. Should one know that baptism is for the remission of sins before being baptized? Brother Brewer. My short answer to that question is absolutely. And the reason I say that is because a person cannot do something not knowing the reason why they're doing it and do it properly. Uh, in other words, 
given this circumstance, a person can't properly be baptized if, if they don't even know why they're doing it or if they're not doing it for the proper reason. Uh, to, to, to say that, that uh, an understanding of what baptism is for isn't necessary to being baptized would basically be saying that a person can basically go to heaven by accident, and that's just simply not the case. No one's going to be saved by accident. It's going to be intentional based on an understanding. I want to think about this real quick just in terms of Acts chapter 19. In Acts 19, Paul came across some disciples who had done the right thing. They had submitted to the right act. They'd been immersed. They'd been baptized. But when Paul started asking them some questions, it became pretty evident that the reason why they had done what they'd done wasn't the reason for which they should have done it. Uh, they had been baptized with John's baptism unto repentance. And this was after the cross, after Christ's baptism had come into effect. Uh, and uh, so Paul took them to the side very quickly and talked to them uh, about why baptism, uh, why they were supposed to be baptized, what baptism was for, uh, what Christian baptism is all about. And notice that once Paul, who, who, to a people who had already done what they should have done, yes, they'd already submitted to the act of baptism, but to a people who had already done what they should have done, Paul taught them the truth about that act. And after they would learned and understood more about what baptism was about uh, and why they should have been baptized, then in verse 5 it says, When they heard this, then they were baptized in the name of of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and so, did they need to know what they needed to be baptized for or what they needed to be baptized unto? Well, Paul believed they did. Uh, and as a result, he took them to the side and, and taught them so that they would understand and so then they could act based on knowledge uh, instead of just instinct. And so, I would say that yes, beyond the shadow of any doubt, a person definitely has to know that baptism is for the remission of sins before they can be properly and scripturally baptized. Uh, because otherwise then that person has just done an act uh, without the, the true and proper purpose. Uh, and so look at Acts chapter 19 and, and kind of study what happened with Paul and those disciples there and I think the answer uh, will become very, very evident. Thank you for that great question. Thank you, Brother Brewer. Now to Brother Peters. We have this question for you. Many Christian young people are seen on Twitter using vulgar and profane language and seem to think nothing about it. Please address this, Brother Peters. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesian brethren, Ephesians 4 and verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It doesn't take long to spend any time on Facebook or other social media sites to, to see individuals using profanity, vulgarities, talking in a way that, a, that one who is trying to follow God's Word should not talk. But there's also gossiping that occurs. There's, there's insults that occur. All of those things would fall under this category of corrupt communication. That is, any type of communication that is designed to pull someone down. Paul says our words are to edify, that is literally to build up individuals, and these are things that pull them down. Now, no one uh, who is claiming to be a, a Christian would agree that it's okay to go out and to speak in a vulgar way or use profanity or gossip about individuals or even insult individuals on a face-to-face -face basis. But the problem with the internet and social media today is that it provides an anonymity. Now this question is specified to young people, but there's a lot of older people who need to understand this as well. When I sit behind my keyboard and I type out that profane language, when I'm gossiping behind my keyboard about someone or using my keyboard to insult someone, well that's just the same as saying it. And that equals that corrupt communication that Paul is telling us to avoid here. That shouldn't be a part of our lifestyle. 
And parents, we have a responsibility to let our children understand this, teach them this so that they can know this. Because if we're not careful, we can get behind that keyboard and even though we would never say it to that person's face, well, we think, well, no one's really seeing me say this. And yet, that's not true at all. Uh, we're to avoid that kind of communication. We're to avoid uh, that profane language. And some of these abbreviations that are used on social media today shouldn't be typed uh, from the fingertips of a Christian, much less said from their lips. Thank you for this question, and I hope that helps. I appreciate each of those good answers. I especially appreciate that last one. I think it's very timely. You know, God hears what we say but God also sees what we type. And not only does God see it, but other people do as well. And many people have lessened their Christian influence greatly by what they have typed on Facebook and social media and uh, earlier on MySpace and other social forums. They've certainly hurt their influence. We're so glad you're watching today and we are grateful for all the different congregations that support a Bible answer. Anna, Illinois, Bishop Street in Union City, Bradford, Tennessee, Central, where I preach in Carothersville, Dexter, Missouri, Doris Chapel in Trenton, Tennessee, Fairview in Milan, Tennessee, Front Street in Milan, Tennessee, Fremont in Union City, Tennessee, Gardner near Martin, Tennessee, Gideon, Missouri, Greenfield, Tennessee, where Brother Arnold labors, uh, Locust Grove in Bradford, Main Street in Troy, Tennessee, Marion, Illinois, Matthews, Missouri, Maple Hill in Benton, Kentucky, a new congregation, Mount Zion near Hornbeak, Tennessee, Mounds, Illinois, Neboville, Tennessee, that's near Yorkville, New Johnsonville, Tennessee, New Madrid, Missouri, also a new congregation, thanks to them, Palmersville, Tennessee, the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, where Brother Brewer labors, and our overseeing congregation, the Pleasant Hill Church of Christ, Trenton, Tennessee, Portageville, Missouri, Ripley, Tennessee, Samford and Steele, Missouri, Sharon, Tennessee, Troy Road in O'Bine, Yorkville, Tennessee, and finally the Whitlock Church of Christ near Paris, Tennessee, by my count, 32 congregations. This is why we do not have to solicit money from our viewers for a Bible answer, because faithful congregations take care of that and support this congregation in such a noble way, and we're grateful to them. We're grateful for you, our viewers, for watching A Bible Answer. Please let us know how we're doing. For your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with a faithful Church of Christ in your area.